Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Tata Steel 2022. This is the 10th round of action, and there were some big battles today, such that I've actually put the Magnus Carlsen game first in this recap, and you don't have to skip to anything. But before we jump into the games, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Babbel. You know that I look at chess a lot during the day, but one of my favorite other hobbies is learning new languages. And Babbel is the absolute best tool to do just that. Lucy and I were lucky enough to be taught another language by our parents and also pick some up in school, but not everybody gets that opportunity. Now we're trying to learn French together. And you should absolutely try to learn a new language. There's a lot of different reasons you would do that. Maybe you're just trying to have some personal growth. Maybe you're trying to reconnect or build a relationship with a family member. Learning a new language can also increase your opportunities in a bigger job market or maybe you just want to do it for fun but if you do it for fun and then you go traveling you have a more enriched experience with that local culture and Babbel makes learning a new language super easy to do one of my favorite things is the fact that there's 10 minute interactive lessons made by real teachers not some repetitive AI making you say the same phrase 36 times in a row there are also podcasts and games it's it's just honestly an awesome app experience so what are you waiting for you should make it a New Year's resolution to learn a new language today. Click my link in the description. You'll get 65% off a Babbel subscription and they have 20 days money back guarantee. Merci beaucoup. Retour à la vidéo. Obviously, these two have some history. They played in a world championship match uh, that Magnus won, but it was extremely close. It was actually probably the most uh, in danger that Magnus was and not retaining his title. Uh, and Sergei begins the game with a Spanish. I mean, obviously a very traditional opening. And Magnus doesn't go for a Sicilian, it's important to note, uh, to try to fight for a win uh, from the first move. Um, and perhaps even more surprisingly, he does not go for a6, bishop a4, knight f6, which is obviously the main line that he's played, you know, in the world championship match. Perhaps it was also a matter of he kind of knows that Karyakin just prepped Nepo a bunch. So instead of going for the main line, he actually invites a Berlin. Now, the Berlin endgame, obviously, with knight takes e4, uh, is, uh, is maybe what Magnus had in mind. And um, the, the Berlin is also an unofficial invitation to make a draw. Maybe not in the mind of Magnus Carlsen, although I don't know. I doubt Magnus wants to offer a draw in the third move. I don't think that's what he's doing. It's an invitation to put the decision to white, on where to take this game, right? So white can play an anti-Berlin and get some very dynamic and imbalanced position where one guy gets two bishops, but damage structure, this is one way to play. Uh, or play the Berlin endgame. So get castles, knight takes e4, and now obviously we have d4, which is, which is the entire main line, uh, which leads to the following Berlin endgame. This is the Berlin wall defense. Uh, but Sergei plays Rook e1. So Rook e1 is a move, uh, but it's a move that leads to a completely symmetrical trade of pawns, right? Both sides keep their deep on where it is. Uh, and then the bishop goes back to f1. Uh, and a couple moves later, there is a trade, and then both sides try to take the center with d4 and d5. This is a very well-known, completely equal position. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit surprising that this is what kind of both of them uh, to, uh, opted for, but obviously at this moment it's up to Sergei if he wants to play the end game. It's also up to Sergei here if he wants to play 9 to Berlin, and he chooses none of those things. Uh, he sends the game to a completely, it's just a complete draw here is what it is. I mean, you could play this forever, uh, but actually we have a repetition of moves from moves 12 to 15, and the players make a draw. Now, uh, the title of this recap is what it is, because obviously this is going to delay Magnus's aspirations of getting 2,900, but also Sergei went to Twitter, and after this, you know, you can pause the video here, go check out Twitter, it's probably not very good marketing for me to advocate for you to do that, um, but uh, Sergei actually made a tweet uh, which said, hashtag draw Magnus, hashtag say no to 2,900, that's all he wrote. And people were pissed off. They were like, what are you doing? What even is this? How are you just gonna make a decision to, you know, to, to play like this uh, and, and not even try to play for a win? And then people were like, well, why did Magnus play the Berlin? I mean, Magnus could have went for a mainline Rue Lopez, right? So Magnus has, uh, has actually kind of shielded himself somehow from any sort of criticism for playing into a draw here because he's winning the tournament and it's a draw with black and what are you gonna do, right? So Magnus draws, he maintains his grasp of first place but a very, very strange day. And then afterwards, Sergei actually tweeted uh, a second time 
uh, and he said, I learned from the world champion Winky Face because Magnus has actually had this draw with White in the online tour. So you are more than welcome to discuss this in the, in the comments in a civil manner or a not civil matter, whatever generates more engagement. I just thought this was kind of, I don't know. I, I, I'm the kind of person that doesn't really get too upset or offended by stuff like this, but it, it, it was a little bit flaccid to start the day like this. But the rest of the games are good. So I wanted to put this game first. I didn't want to kind of hype you up for no reason. Magnus's quest for 2900 delayed. And apparently now his quest is going to be delayed on purpose. So people are not even going to try to take risks. They're going to just take two rating points off of him by drawing him with white with no fight. The next game that I would like to show you is an absolutely insane game. Trust me. Trust me. The rest of these games are insane. I mean, I know we got Magnus out of the way, but oh my god. Daniel Duba versus Nils Grandile is Daniel trying to take advantage of the fact that Nils hasn't gotten a win yet. He's having a rough event and he's trying to play, you know, a good game. So we have a big trans uh, transposition here. We have uh, a Sicilian invitation played on the second move. And then we have bishop b5 check, so a bit of an anti-Sicilian. And white plays not with uh, c4 and then d4, uh, but white plays c3 and then queen e2 and then d4. So white decides to take the center with the d-pawn and reinforce it like this. So uh, normally the, the, this kind of completely symmetrical structure is completely better for white because it's just better to have more space. Uh, but nowadays black has found uh, the immediate launch of the d-pawn and this check to be a good liquidation uh, mechanism. And now black actually can get away with playing this absurd move knight to g8. Knight g8 reroutes the knight to e7. And if you remove all the pieces from the board, this structure, which is actually a structure that comes from the advanced French defense. Uh, if you don't know what the advanced French is, you can also go look that up, but watch the recap first. I'm trying to get you to leave the screen way too many times. In the French, if you clear all the pieces, this pawn is just a liability for white because it's very difficult to protect without pawns, right? Because there's no other pawns. So white is going to have to try to do something and utilize the center space advantage, take control of the C file. Daniel Dubov here plays the absolutely insane long castles. Uh, and in one move, he completely shows his intentions for the remainder of the game. He can be checked, and that very well might be the best move, but obviously Nils just, okay, the king was going to be one obviously anyway, so there's no real need to play the move rook c8. You also might want your rook behind your b-pawn. Uh, Nils brings the knight here, and a couple moves later is going to castle. But not yet, because Dubov is actually trying to attack him. So if you just castle into this and you completely don't believe in my attack, I play h5. And if you try to attack me here, I'm going to play h6. I'm going to go full alpha zero. And this will leave you with no breathing room for your king and a permanent endgame liability on h7. So this is definitely not what you want to allow. Uh, and instead of that, Nils plays queen b6. Queen b6 attacks the pawn in the center, and the second that Dubov plays h5, Nil shuts that right down with the move h6. He doesn't let that pawn get close, a la Chael Sonnen and Vanderlei Silva, right? So that's, uh, that's, that's for my MMA fans. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about when I make references to MMA, NBA, movies, don't worry. Don't worry, don't worry. So, you know, uh, my favorite types of comments are when people are like, you talk too much. Like, should I... Should I talk with less words in the same amount? I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know what folks want, right? I feel like if we just talk for chess for 30 minutes, it would kind of be boring. Anyway, Duov continues to attack, all right? Let's talk chess. Uh, queen b5. Queen b5 doesn't look uh, like the queen is actually going to do anything. It's, it's to bring the knight behind the queen. And the queen controls this diagonal and maintains pressure here. You want to bring your knight into the attack. Someone's going to probably lose this game. I mean, generally, when you castle on opposite sides and attacks are so close to each other, bad things are going to happen. g5 is a crazy move that leads to a four sequence, knight to b4. Uh, and if white takes on h6, black plays knight d3. And it's actually black who's threatening mate first. It's very easy to lose here. Uh, this is a very dangerous position. So instead of that, he plays a3, preventing anything. And now knight back to e7. Knight h4, knight b6. The new knight is coming. Now the knight has arrived on c4, queen a6. So Dubov, by moving the queen here, has admitted... Uh, and by the way, he couldn't take his knight. The queen was there, right? He has admitted that this attack might not work. And actually, he has to come back. So he brings the queen this way. But here, Nils can, uh, can, can, can seize the attack for himself by playing queen b5, rook c8, and bringing the pawns. Like, there's just no way that a move like g5 works because you hang mate. Congrats, good job, you hung mate. Good job, you're, I mean, it's a good thing that you're watching the games and not playing them, right? So, queen b3 offers a trade of queens, and Dubov offers a draw. 
Not out loud, but I mean, he's repeating moves, right? He, I, I don't know, maybe he wouldn't have repeated moves, but Nils chooses to play on and he should because Nils has the advantage. Again, G5 here doesn't hang mate, but there is this incredible move. Knight takes E5 and I defend my rook and I also uh, threaten your rook and the queens are, I mean, it's just a, a way to win a pawn, right? So uh, Nils now begins the chopping down process. He trades off two pieces. He splits the pawns. Nils is minus three. The game is over. He plays queen c4 check. He repeats once to gain a little bit of time back on the clock and now plays rook c6, rook b6, knight c6. That's it. I mean, the king is butt naked. He just is. I'm sorry. I mean, I, maybe you didn't want that graphic. Maybe you're watching with the kids. I don't know. But he is. The king's got no clothes. So what do you do to a king that's got no clothes? Well, I mean, I mean you probably, I mean, you probably ask him what's going on. Uh, but we have, uh, we have queen back to c2, uh, and now we have rook, rook here, right? King to c1, rook a6. And again, we have a shuffling of moves. So how does Nils actually win? Well, apparently the way he has to win is knight c6. He just has to slowly bring his pieces. He probably didn't like g5. But when you, when you plug this into the machine, it, it's not afraid at all, and it finds check here and queen a6 to attack this pawn. The computer just doesn't believe in this at all, because you have check, and then you win the queen. And th that nothing happens on that side. So it's difficult when you're on, like, three moves before the time control, right? So Nils decides not to d risk it and trade queens and forcefully pick up a pawn before the time control. And he makes the 40th move. Both sides have now made 40 moves. Nils is up a pawn. However... The majority of the advantage, according to if you watch this with a computer, is gone. Because it's not minus three anymore, because he doesn't have the queen and the knight and the rook all together. He's in an endgame, right? And the endgame is a little bit tricky, because white still has more space. And okay, you're up a pawn, but th these are your extra pawns, so you have to figure out something to do. By the way, if I can just mention, just to give you an understanding, Daniel is up like an hour. Daniel played this game as if he was late to a party or something, and, you know, he had to finish the game, he had to get on a bus or catch a cab, and, like, this guy was playing so fast, right? So, Daniel plays knight b3, here come the, the, you know, the queen side expansion, here comes b4, Nils is trying to crack the pawn structure, get to this pawn, win the end game, uh, but obviously things are well protected. Now, the move b4 is actually a mistake, and leads to a 13-move sequence that allows Daniel to draw on the spot. There are some wrinkles, but I wanted to show you, like, this is an insane line. The better move here is c4. The point is that after takes, 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 it's very difficult for black to move because this is touched, like, this is touched and king b3 is coming, right? So you play a5 to protect, but now that you play a5, your rook is trapped. So Bl white plays check here and sacks the d-pawn because the point is you're trying to go d6. If takes, which is the only move, then you play rook f8, nobody can protect this, and now the e-pawn is going to be a passer. Everything forced. Now black has to find b3, the best counter shot, immediately activating the rook and trying to hit g4, e4, f4, right? We have rook takes f7, rook b4 protects the pawn, uh, and now you try to play a4. So now the b-pawn is protected, and you're just in time to stop the white pawn, but white has rook f4. Now you come down and give a check. You hunt the king out, you both make queens, and the white king hides on a5. And there are no more checks. There are no more checks, and the game ends in a draw. I mean, well, it's going to be a perpetual check very soon. This is the sequence that Dubov has to go for. He doesn't see it, and instead he plays pawn takes b4, and Nils is back in the driver's seat picking up the pawn on d4, uh, but Daniil activates his rook, and he's going to win a pawn back. Nils parts ways with the F pawn and starts pushing the A pawn. Dubov is also trying to maybe push and checkmate the guy. It's very unpleasant, right? So how is Nils going to try to win? He goes fully investing in his A pawn and he blocks the rook from seeing it. He pushes the white knight into the corner and still, shockingly, in this position with rook B1, we have takes, takes, and something like king B2 and white draws. Like, this is just a draw. I mean... You know, you're going to get something like rook f1 taking this, king a2, rook f4, rook e6. This is a draw. But maybe a little bit annoying to protect. And here, Dubov gives away his knight. He doesn't go for the rook endgame. He sacks the knight to play this. Because he thinks that the pin is so strong in the a-file. I'm not even sure if Dubov thinks he's drawing or playing this for a win. Right, so rook c1, king d2, rook f1. And now Dubov breaks through. And he's actually, I mean... 
it's lost for white, but it's kind of tricky. And it's so tricky that Nils, in his first opportunity to convert, blunders a draw. He blunders a draw because king f7, rook b7, if you go here, you hang mate. It's insane. So it's just a repetition of moves, right? He shuffles back and forth, and then he decides to play king e8 and run out this way. But now Dubov has gotten to d4, and he's going to win this pawn. And Dubov wins this pawn. This is now a draw. King e4, rook g5, and white has to play rook e6. The point of rook e6, it's a waiting move. For example, if black plays rook g1, threatening knight g5, the king goes here. And if the rook goes this way, the king comes in this way. So the rook has to stay protecting, right? And if you play something like this, I have rook e7, h4, e6. So Daniil has to find the right configuration of king, pawns, and rook. And Daniil, on move 76, plays too fast with 50 minutes on the clock versus two and blunders knight back to the corner. Knight g6 comes and black consolidates winning the pawn and that's it. Because of the threat of the fork, he has to move his king or his rook and now that's it. He wins the e-pawn, he pushes the pawn to h5 and on move 82, Nils Grandelius wins his first game of Tata Steel 2022. Oh my god, are you not entertained? We're only 15 minutes into this recap. I gotta speed things up. I don't want this to be a 40 minute recap. Oh my goodness. Okay, I have three more games to show you. Isn't that completely nuts? Okay, I have a game Fabiano Caruana versus Richard Report. Jeez, C4, E6, and we have what's known as a Mikenas Karos. Here the main line is D5, E5, D4, we trade knights and something like this happens, but, but, Report plays c5, which doesn't stop e5, but it stops d4, or so you would think, the knight goes back to g8, only Report can do stuff like this, but it's actually completely fine, black is known to be okay here, uh, and white solidifies in the center, wants to build around the pawn, maybe castle queenside, we're about to find out, so d6, knight f3, exactly, we're trying to fight, uh, we're, we're having a big battle here for the center pawn, uh, queen goes to g5, pressuring g7, and Fabiano invites an exchange, and Richard plays f5. So, white probably has to decide here whether they want to take on h6. On the one hand, you damage the structure. On the other hand, you no longer have any dark squared bishop. So, uh, plus the g file might be open for the opponent, which is kind of unpleasant. Long castle is played by Fabiano, and the knight goes to e5. Knight e5 is an amazing move. If you take, it's rook d8, and rook takes eight, uh, h8, so that's bad. So Richard has to play knight f7. Fabiano goes here, here, and goes to an endgame where he is probably slightly better. He is probably slightly better because the c-pawn is obviously a liability. He has a slightly more active kind of configuration of pieces, and mostly pawn structure is really what it comes down to. So a slightly more pleasant position. Let's see if Fabiano can convert it. g5. Now g5... Uh, machine wasn't the biggest fan of because it thought that you could immediately try to go for an h-pawn thrust and something like g4 trying to build up you have knight a4 and and basically the black pawns are a bit overextended however knight a4 first allows h5 and we kind of we kind of get a similar position i mean we get something that more or less uh looks uh you know Looks about the same. H4 or G4. It's unclear here whether it's better for, you know, for a position to look uh, like this. It's not clear whether you want the structure like this or whether you want the structure like you get in the game. Fabiano chooses to play G4 here, trying to just kind of poke around in the pawn structure. Uh, and now uh, report, uh, report here doesn't take en passant. So, you know, we got to hit him with a brick. Knight to E5. Uh, that's apparently an inside joke uh, of Anarchy Chess if you don't play en passant. Uh, you get bricked, uh, that uh, and uh, yeah, that's 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 it. You should not look up where you get bricked, but you get bricked. So rook d4 and Fabi just gives away g4. The problem with this is that you're not going to get takes takes rook g4. That's not what you're going to get at all. That's positionally winning for white because I already told you these pawn liabilities are simply too big. Black has three pawn islands. Instead, you're going to get hit with this savage move, and all of a sudden, oh my goodness. The bishop on c8 protects the pawn and hits the bishop, right? So now we have this, this, and Fabi's just down a pawn, but it's even worse than that. Even though Fabi can potentially win e5, which he actually does, it's three on one. These three pawns will decide this game. We have the rook rotating over, well, well, the two pawns. I mean, one of them has to die for the greater good. Rook e4, right? We use the pawn as a decoy to move the knight. We take with check. 
And uh, yeah, bishop e6, and um, we're gonna go here and here. Now the game is not over. The game is not over, but it's mighty unpleasant to deal with two pa pawns like this and bishop versus knight. Bishop is better than knight because it's just, it's, it's a long range menace, right? So rook g1, right? Rook f8. Now we have knight to d3 and g4. It's, it's just such, a, such an annoying position to protect and with low time, right? So knight goes to f4. Uh, check here, rook d8. King is trying to walk over. Now we have a little bit of a little mini dance there on the queen side. Don't worry about it. That's 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 really all we get. And it's it seems effortless for this position to be played by black. I mean, king, bishop, two pawns, right? It doesn't even matter if you if if, if the knight hits the pawn on h4. Uh, and now report uses uh, a very a very important thing that you should use g3. Anytime you have a pawn majority two on one, look for a pawn sacrifice breakthrough. Takes. Oh, sorry. Takes. H3, that's obviously the idea. And then H2 and bishop E4. And Report wins this game by using his pawns. Now, they never actually got a final opportunity to move because Fabiano actually got mated. But, uh, yeah, Report beats Fabiano with black. An amazing, amazing game. Uh, much faster, not an 80-move game like the last one, but uh, a super complex game. Uh, from a from a very unpopular opening, an opening that that is not played that often at the highest level, which is this knight g8 mechanis, and uh, yeah, R report goes on a kingside expansion with moves like f5, and then further g5 and h5. Just very interesting how he took space and didn't actually move any of the other pieces. Uh, so the lesson here is just push your pawns as far as possible. Maybe good things will happen. You didn't hear it from me. Results may vary. Uh, fourth game that I would like to show you is the game between Andrei Sipienka and Jordan Van Forest. Uh, this one uh, between two of the younger players in the event who both have gotten wins and are trying to end the tournament strong. And first thing in an e45 position to see the knight on c3 is very rare. So that's already a rare sight. Uh, point is you usually build up with c3 and d4. But it gets even weirder, so there's an invitation to damage my pawns. But this is actually very good for white, because white will castle and have the open f-file and be very happy. Uh, but bishop b6, this position has never been seen before. I think. I was looking at the database, I've, and, and, and apparently this exact move order, this exact position has never been seen before. Um, so, knight a5, and now we have another trade, and like we, we basically, after castles castles, just get a middle game of knight versus bishop and the rest of the squad. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Both sides have all eight pawns, queens and rooks. So who's gonna win? I don't know, we'll find out. Queen to e7, queen e1, f5. So Van Forest tries to expand with his f pawn, right? He invites this exchange and then he plays c5. But the thing about playing like this is who's going to deal with the light squared Swiss cheese? Okay, well, it's a good thing we have a light squared bishop but now knight h4, so now the knight rotates and is trying to fight the light squares, right? It's trying to fight on the light squares. Rook comes over to g5. Now, this rook probably should trade here, uh, and maybe black can bring another rook to e8 and just try to be solid. It is admittedly a bit of an unpleasant position if the knight ever lands on g6, but the queen is actually very good on g5, and this could be a potential problem for white. So here Jordan had to, had to decide what to do with his rook, and he moved it to g5. Queen f3 takes control of the file, and all of a sudden, just imagine a situation where there was this trade. Uh, I know white can do this, but let's say white somehow just forgets about that and the move a6 happens. How does this rook get home? How does that rook get... If you play rook h5, like, I don't know, if you play rook h5, fair, but it's, you know, if, if g3 you have g5, fair, but even here I have rook f1 check, King g7, how does the rook get home? How does the, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. And I think you know where I'm going with this. Yesipenko begins building a cage. He just plays a bunch of solid moves, and obviously Jordan's like, oh, well, I gotta create some counterplay or else I'm kinda screwed, which is what he's trying to do, right? But takes, takes, c4. Now there's no central break with, with d5. All that Yesipenko has to do is not blunder some crazy thing on the queen side, which he can do by playing rook f2. How does this rook get home? This rook is stranded. It has absolutely no moves. But how do you win it? Because if you move out of the way, you're going to allow it back into the game, right? So queen a5, 
and a couple moves later we have this trade of pawns queen takes on d6 but tactics are flying bishop c4 the rook is trying to be broken out of jail with a sacrifice and queen g3 an incredible idea by jordan creating some counterplay and now even though the rook is not gonna get home it's not gonna get trapped so the entirety of the game is based around this rook and yesipenko allows some 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 tactics on the other side of the board right he he could have been a little bit more precise here like for example right here uh, he could have played g4, which is the critical move. And then if black plays a3, there is takes, queen a3. And if you go for the same idea, there just is no queen g3 because the pawn blocks the rook. So g4 was the important move to finish building the cage, but he wasn't able to do it. Jordan breaks out and wins the knight. And okay, I mean, white is a pawn up, but certainly the game is not over, right? Okay, uh, we just have to not trade into a losing rook end game. But this is starting to look very annoying now because that pawn is super strong on c5. And Jordan plays some good defense for a very long time. But look who it is again. The same character. The rook is again the problem because it's stuck protecting the king from checks. And if we do an instant replay, right, queen f5, why didn't he just play king h8? We didn't play king h8 because that. And if you take the rook, check here queen c6 it's almost like the entirety of this game yesipenko's pieces were a touch more coordinated than the black pieces and he all the tactics worked in his favor his king was safer his pieces were less loose because of it and because jordan now has to play defense on that rook h5 is coming so black has to play h5 himself and yesipenko it's just a little bit about being precise here he can just gobble both pawns but you know the russian in him made him play a few more consolidating moves uh, before taking h5, taking e5, and uh, he just had to, like I said, trade advantageously, not accidentally blunder into some not winning endgame. Uh, but, you know, he's a 2700 rated super GM, who also happens to be from the most probably strategic and uh, kind of methodical uh, chess country in the world, and he wins in 60 moves. I told you, some big battles! Uh, and he beats Jordan Van Forest in 60 moves, and he's been, he's gaining like 12 points this tournament. So, amazing tournament for Yesipenko, who wins. Uh, and the final game that I have for you is the Indian Derby uh, between Gujarati and Prague. Uh, this is uh, this is a crazy, crazy game, uh, and it was um, it wasn't even the longest game of the round. I think Dubov actually won that title, but it was very, very close. Uh, so, if you stuck around, you made it this long. Uh, and obviously there's a very large Indian audience cheering for both of these players. Let's see what happens. D4, knight f6, and we have a Nimso Indian with queen to c2. Now, uh, diehard fans of this tournament and those of you with good memories remember that this exact position up until this very moment was seen in the game Richard Report versus Prague. So Vidit knew what was going to happen. Vidit had a good idea that Prague might play this line again, and rather than playing queen g3, he played queen f3, which is a slightly less popular move, but has been seen by some pretty strong players with the white pieces, such as Wang Hao from China, and some random bozo from Norway named something like Mo Ma Mangus, Mango, Charlson, I don't know, something like that. Uh, against Levan Ranyan in some online tournament, uh, probably like known as some Meltwater Tour. Anyway, yeah, some pretty interesting players have played this move, Queen F3. The point is pressure here, the point is pressure here, and just a slightly different development scheme. Black plays Knight D7, attacking the C5 pawn. White attacks the center, point being that if you take back on C5 here, I take this, and then if you trade queens with me, I win this. And if you play this, it's just a trash move. It's just a really bad opening of your king. So... Everything that you're seeing here, this trade, long castles, this big buildup in the center, and bishop to g4 as a threat has all been seen before. Knight e2, and here black either plays d3 or bishop to g4. Both of these moves have been seen, uh, and it looks like, it looks like Vidit has just committed a horrible mistake. Oh my god, no, but this is actually theory. These are all the best moves. Now we have danger levels. Rook takes d3, hits the queen. So it's going to be a battle of who has the better prep. Queen goes out to a5. Now here, four games have been played and all four have gone queen g3. On a low depth, my Stockfish really likes taking on b7 and just going for it. I don't know if Stockfish needs like two cigarettes and 30 minutes to figure out whether this is just simply too dangerous. Uh, but uh, it actually seems to like this position. It seems to really like the fact that you can even sacrifice your rook and just be better because you have four on one. And that's winning. That's what it likes. It thinks you can sack the rook, go for this four on one. Um, 
But every game thus far in the database, including the one in front of you, has gone queen g3. I don't know why. Maybe they have better prep. Maybe they're just remembering the games that have already happened. Uh, but this position is brand new. And in the most counterintuitive of fashions, the way that white has to take advantage here is not attacking the king on opposite side castling, but actually moving the pawns in front of his own king. So this is a very hot potato type of opening, because even though that this queenside expansion could be the way to go to get an advantage, like, it's it's very dangerous. So Vidit play, uh, sorry, Prague plays a5, which is a human move. Uh, Bishop, uh, sorry, pawn b5, you don't want to open the a file for your opponent. Prague takes and brings his queen to c4. Now, Vidit plays rook c1, Prague plays a4 to try to play queen b3, and Vidit has an opportunity here to play a move that gives him an advantage. I don't know how practical it is. It's the move queen e7. Allowing this check, but defending his pawn from a distance. And if something like rook e8 trying to remove the queen from the defense, queen b4. Point is that even though you damage your own structure, you're winning the battle on that side of the board. You're up a pawn, by the way. So this whole line of black that Black is playing relies on being down a pawn for activity. Black is trying to just attack at all costs. And Vidit has to play queen e7, queen b4 to consolidate the position, right? Something like this and play queen b4 and, and, and he's in the clear. I mean, maybe not just completely winning, but he's in the clear and now he can slowly begin consolidating. He plays knight b1 which still invites this check, but I guess his idea was to play rook b2 or queen b2 to kick out the, the queen. The problem is, this is too passive. This is not what the position demands. The queen should be kind of like doing the defending. The knight should be on c3, because now, even at the trade of a rook, Prague has a really annoying position. Really annoying. Queen f5, queen c4, and the machine already wants to repeat moves. The computer wants to play rook d4, uh, queen c1, Rook d1, if you take, that's hanging by the way, if anybody's confused. So it just wants to repeat moves. It's like, I've had enough. Prague goes back, and now Vidit has another opportunity to take over the, uh, the, the advantage of this game, which is, wait, I made a passive move and it was bad. He made a passive move and it was bad. Now I have h4, g4, g5. This is what, this is what the machine gives, to just go totally crazy, and now we do go back to the kind of age-old advice of if you're castled on opposite sides, launch a violent attack on your opponent, whether physical or on the chessboard. Although, in this case, I don't think you can punch Prague. You might get sued. He's too young. If he was like 20, uh, fair, fair, fair game. Uh, but you, you just have to go for it. You just have to throw a punch. I mean, I'm sitting here. Would I have played H4? I don't know. Probably not. Would I have even gotten to this tournament? Probably not. But he plays G3. So a second time, Vidit just trying to be a little bit solid, not allow his structure to be attacked. Prague plays b6, also trying to be solid. If anyone's wondering whether a4 is hanging, it absolutely is. But if you take this pawn, this one tempo allows black to get his knight into the game. If you look at this position, this knight's never getting into the game. Like if the knight went to e8 in this position, white plays rook d7, queen f7, uh-oh. And if queen c4, queen trade. Again, the more pieces you trade, the more likely you're going to be in a winning endgame with white because you're up material. So b6, rook a4, but now here comes knight d7. It is insane to me that one of these guys is up two pawns and is barely better. Barely better. Like, he's better, but he's barely better. How does he actually win this position? He goes rook e4. Could he have played rook d4? Sure. But how do you win? You can't move an entire piece. The second that you get this knight out, you lose. You just lose the game. You say, Levy, I don't understand. How do you lose the game? How are you going to lose this? Knight e6. Okay. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Rook here. Okay. Queen c1. Rook c2. You just can't move. You, so so it's, a, it's really difficult. So how do you play a game where you can't move? Rook e4. G6. Queen f4. Well, obviously, you're trying to trade queens. Prague's like, no, I don't want to trade queens. Um, and in this position, queen c5, already the tide begins turning because Vidit has to not go for this. And he has to play rook b4 uh, and make sure that he doesn't lose any of his pawns. Uh, he goes queen h6, and his idea must have been this. This must have been what he wanted, I mean, from a quick glance. But, uh-oh. King a2, rook c2, king b3, and it's probably mating 2 or 3. Oh yeah, it's mating 2, knight c5. So, a really good example of how bad this can get if everybody abandons the king. King is a feeble dude. King is a feeble dude. 
So a four, and you know how a couple moves ago I said, um, uh, I said that even though Vidit is up two pawns, he's barely better. Now Vidit is up two pawns and dead lost. Dead lost. It's minus three. How? How? I mean, don't you just play rook h4? Check the same problem, right? So queen comes back to f4, and here comes Prague, right? Here comes Prague. The knight is coming. He's going to bring the rook. It was actually better to bring the rook to a8 and try to get for this in b5. Um... The insane thing is that after rook d8, rook c2, it's still rook a8 that wins, but they have no time. It's move 37. So it's around that time of the game where you're going to mess things up. Queen comes down to h1, and now queen c4 is the equalizing move. If knight takes a4, hoping for uh, some tricks on the a-file, queen c6. You force an exchange, and uh, now it's a draw. I mean, it's, it, it, it's still, there's still chess to be played, but... Knight c5, you go for these pawns, and you're, it's most likely going to end in a draw. But it's, it's still far from easy. Uh, the equalizing move is queen c4, but after this, we have a very difficult decision. It is the 40th move of the game. Vidit has to make the time control. Does he sack his queen? This is why you cannot take. Does he sack his queen and try to defend this endgame, which is probably losing... But maybe not. Does he do it or no? He decides not to. He doesn't go for the trade of queen versus rook and knight and instead chooses to defend this position where he is still a pawn up, but the king is being hidden in a nuclear shelter, okay? This is a terrifying position. The queen comes back and now it's not just that your king is being hunted. I'm going to start eating the pawns. I'm just standing out here with my sniper and I'm chewing an apple, okay? I'll shoot what I want to. I mean, I'm going to eat an apple in the meantime. So how does Vidit defend, okay? He tries to push some pawns and at some point he would love a queen trade. Prague's like, I'm good, no queen trade. Thanks, Vidit. You're the man, though. Rook a8, threatening the king. The rook has to come back and block. And Vidit says, you want a queen trade? And Prague says, you know what? This time? Yeah because your pawns are terrible, and I think I can win this endgame. Vidit's like, all right, young blood, try it. Prague's like, why did you call me young blood? That's so weird. Vid and Vidit's like, stop talking to me during the game. So, rook and knight, but two pawns versus one, all on the same side. The story is, can Vidit hold on to this pawn and defend it forever and get to a uh, one pawn down endgame where he can sack his knight? Because knight and pawn versus knight is a draw. The knight just sacks for a pawn. So Vidit's defending. He's defending. He's defending. And believe it or not, actually, here, it's apparently a draw. It's apparently a draw. As scattered as this position is, right? Now we have rook c8, rook d5. Knight d1 check. Apparently, rook d5. Just a centralizing move. Defending the knight. Preventing knight d3. Is an inaccuracy. It allows the sneaky knight d1 check, king moves, and the knight comes back. And now, even if the king had gone to b3, so for example, even if the king had gone to b3, we would have gone for a check of some sort and forced the king over here. You say, why? Because you can't go to the c file. Fork. Vidit doesn't realize here, I guess, he is being forced away from the action. And knight e3 leads to a trade of knights. And this endgame is probably winning for black. It would have been better if Vidit obviously hadn't played rook d5 and maybe just preemptively moved out of the way first. Just preemptively gotten out of the way of, of any sort of knight shenanigans. But he plays rook d5 and allows a forced sequence of moves into an endgame. How, how is it a win? In any endgame where you have a two-on-one, if you make a one-on-zero, you need a couple of things. Number one, if the enemy king is completely cut off, you're winning. You will slowly march your king and pawn up, you will hide from the rook checks, and you will use your rook as a shield, and you need to slowly but surely make it down and win the game. But it's not that simple. The alternative is you let the king in but you bring your rook to a square like f5 where it pressures and doesn't allow this rook any activity. So let's see if Prague can figure this out. You, can't, you cannot rush with a move like f6 because you might play check and lose this pawn. And I'm not sure you're ever going to win this because the time you have to spend winning this pawn, uh, I'm going to bring my king. And also your king is cut off, right? So you need your king, rook and pawn all active. You need the king cut off. So we have king g8. You're going to see a little bit of shuffling here because the players are low a little bit on time, right? They So Prague is kind of building up, 
what he thinks he needs for the win. The king is continuously getting cut off. Rook a5. You say, why rook a5? Well, the rook is out of squares. Can't go to b7 because of this. So the rook has to come up, and Prague tries to outmaneuver Vidit without moving his f-pawn. Could Prague have moved, uh, for example, f5? And then if check, king g8? Maybe. This is maybe winning as well, because the rook will try to go here and win the pawn, while this rook harasses, you know, some something something like, uh, like oh, well, rook b6 would, would lose, but I'm saying something like, like this would probably be winning, yes. Um, but he chooses to do it by bringing his king, and Vidit runs out of squares, and Prague realizes something here. If the rook gets to f5, it defends the weakness, it targets this, and it threatens a trade. If the rook gets to f5, he wins the game. And that is exactly what he goes for, so as to walk in front of his own rook. King g4, rook f5, the second pawn has been corralled, and Vidit resigns. 78 moves later, Vidit succumbs to the pressure of the young Pragnananda, and this 40-minute recap is over, and what a day. Magnus Carlsen still up top with 7 points out of 10, followed closely by Anish Giri with 6.5, and, uh, and Mamid Yarovin report tied with 6. See, there's a link to the standings. You could go check it out in the other section. I mean, Arjun Guysi is just, is just bullying the field. He's 2 points in first place after 10 rounds. I, what, do you, what do you even want? It's just bullying to even show his games at this point. Thanks for watching, folks. I will see you for round 11. Get out of here.